uh, the, the spiritual director I had for my sabbatical said, Brian, this would be a good opportunity for you to get out there and try different churches that you normally wouldn't go to. I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. And so I'm walking into this building, and the sanctuary is narrow and it's long, and there's stained glass everywhere. And there are these marble pillars that are like holding up the room, and it just feels very formal. So I walk in, and I sit down, and I wait for the service to start, and I notice that there's this stage uh, that has this huge table on it that they would call an altar with a big book open and candles and things, and there was this kneeler, this rail that had a kneeler around the stage. And so I'm just sitting there, taking it all in, and then the service starts, and there's music playing. Uh, and it's live music, it's not recorded music, but there's nobody on stage. The stage is empty. And then I start to hear voices, and voices are filling the room, and I, I'm looking around for these voices because they're nowhere to be found, and I realize, oh, they're in the balcony. There's a balcony with a choir and an organ, and I look back to see them, and as I do, I notice that there is this procession that starts the service, and I look back, and there's a group of people wearing robes, and one of them has a pole on the front, and there's a, a banner that has some words on it. And then behind them is another person carrying a pole with a cross on the top. And then the third person, I think, was just a support person uh, because they weren't carrying anything, nor did they really do much during the service. So maybe moral support, right? And then there was the priest walking in, hugging her Bible and smiling and waving to people as she kind of marched down the center aisle, so, which was all fine and good. Like, I, I knew this was a liturgical, high church experience. I was kind of expecting all that. But as soon as the service got started, like, I was lost as a goose, like absolutely lost. So they start with a few words of welcome, and then they start singing songs. Great. Like, we sing songs, but they didn't have a screen. There was no words projected, and there was no like, hey, turn to this book, to this number, and we're going to sing together. They just started. Now, I know church well enough to know that there's this board on the front of the room that has numbers listed, which are hymnal numbers. So I'm like, oh, great. We're singing hymn 227. So I pick up the hymnal. I find 227, and I start to look. And as I'm like looking at the words, I'm like, like these words aren't the same words that everybody else is singing. And I'm like re-looking at the number and like making sure I have the right number, and I do, and I'm scanning. I'm like, maybe there's like extra pages. I don't know. And so it's like two-thirds of the way through the song, and I look down in the pew back in front of me, and there's another book. So I pick that, pick that book up, and I'm like, oh, this thing has numbers too. So I turn to the 227 page and realize I finally found the song just as they were ending the song. So then they go into their next song, and I've got two books in hand. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to find this one. It was like a game. Like, can I find the song before it ends? And eventually I find it, and I sing along with about half of that song. And then they go into a responsive reading where the priest says something, and the congregation responds. The priest says something else, and then everybody says everything together. And so I'm looking for that reading, thinking like, oh, maybe it's in the prayer book, and I start looking for that, and I can't find it. And then I look down at the program to say, maybe the program will tell me where it is. Well, that reading was in the program. And so now I'm holding two books and the program, and I am just like exhausted at this point. So we pass the piece and everything, and the priest says, sit down. And I have on the pew around me my Bible, two books open in this program. And if I was in a library with all that out on a desk, you would think I was like studying for the board exams or something. And I, find, I found myself thinking to myself, sitting in service, that service, like this service is weird. Like this is just weird. And I'm feeling a little insecure because I'm also thinking I'm a pastor. Like I lead services for a living. It's what I do. I shouldn't be this lost in a service. This thing is weird. And I wonder if anybody here this morning has had experiences like that, where you walk into a new church and you're just lost beyond belief. And I don't think that church is necessarily weird. It, it's not any weirder than we are weird. Because let's be honest, as a church, and, and sometimes if we step back and honestly evaluate Christianity in general, like sometimes it can be weird. Like what we do can just be weird. I remember going to a church when I was in college. I was new, and they served coffee, and they had these gold mugs. And there was a sign 
next to the gold mugs that said, if this is your first time, grab a gold mug, get coffee, and we'll know that you're new. I'm like, there is no way I'm grabbing a gold mug. I don't want to stand out like a new weirdo in this place. Like sometimes church is just weird. You show up to church, you don't know anybody, and people are starting to call you brother and sister, and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. we are not from the same family at all. And if we're honest, the culture around us sometimes perceives us as weird. And sometimes we get their perception of us in different pop cultural moments, like Ned Flanders, right? Like the, the world sometimes thinks we are sweater-wearing, Bible-hugging, stargazing weirdos who are just out in nature having an oodly goodly time, right? Like that's just how sometimes the world perceives us. I mean, and sometimes we don't do ourselves any favor because we use words and we have this lingo that sometimes separates us. Like, we say, hey, did you do your Devo this morning? People are like, Devo? What's a Devo? Oh, that's short for devotion. Devotion? What, what's a devotion? Oh, it's my quiet time. Quiet time? That's something I give my five-year-old and you at 35 are having a quiet time? What is this all about, right? Like, we have this lingo that we use. Like, who here has ever said, heard anybody else say, hey, I, I want to give you traveling mercies, right? Somebody who's not a Christian, like, hey, have traveling mercies. No, they say, like, hey, have a safe trip, right? Or they'll say, hey, I want to pray a hedge of protection around you. I've never been going into a scary situation thinking, like, hey, if I just had a shrub around me, everything would be okay, right? Or, or maybe the worst one is all, we, we say that we have been washed with the blood, right? Like, I don't want anybody washing me with anybody else's blood, right? Like, we have these phrases that are just kind of weird. And then any 90s kids here, like, we had weird clothes in the 90s. Anybody have any of these t-shirts, right, that took popular brand icons and turned them into Jesus shirts? Like, instead of Rhesus, it says Jesus. Instead of the Burger King logo, it was King of Kings. Like, it's just things that make us sometimes appear weird. Now, like we said in the announcement video, we're starting a new series this week called This is Meadowbrook. And, and one of the reasons we're doing this series is because we're stepping into a really significant year for our church as we get going into 2024. In part, if you've been with us for a lot of this past year, back in the spring, we did a series called Forward. Um, and we started talking about what it means for us as a church to move forward into the future. And we said one of the things that we believe that God is calling us to do as a church to have a lasting impact on the neighborhoods around us is to rethink how we use our space. And so we are stepping into, and hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll say more about this in the weeks to come, that the building project that we talked about in the spring should get started before we hit Thanksgiving. Now, if you're new and you're like, what are you talking about? You can find these booklets out near the Connection Center in the lobby, and it kind of explains the what and the why behind our building renovation. But I think why this series is significant for us is because when churches start to do work on their building, they can easily lose focus on their mission because they think, oh, this is so cool. Like new building, new stuff, things look new and fresh. And you can lose sight that the point of what we do isn't the building. Like hopefully the building is just a tool. Like what we want to see as a church is people brought to Jesus, not cool buildings. And so this series reminds us, hey, this is what our mission is. Is. This is what we are about as a church, and hopefully we can hold it in front of us as we step into this next year to say, this is what God is calling us to do. And here's our mission statement. If you've never seen it before, it's this, that Meadowbrook Church exists to invite people to discover Jesus and become his fully devoted followers who influence the world. And we regularly say that there are four words that carry the weight of that statement, invite, discover, become and influence. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at these four different words, one each week, to see how, how in the scriptures, the church from the beginning did these four things and how we are called to continue to live in that stream of life even today. And so this week, we're going to look at the word invite. But it raises the question, if Christianity sometimes appears weird, 
to the world around us and sometimes is weird, like why would we want to invite anybody else into it? Like why would we do that? If they're like, you guys are a bunch of weirdos, and we're like, hey, come on, have fun. Like why would we do that? Well, in Acts 2, there's a story that shows both how even from the very beginning of the church, the cultural, cultural around it had a strange perception of the church, but also gives reason why we would invite somebody in. And so this is where our passage begins this morning. This is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. We read, Then Peter stood up, Peter being one of the apostles, with the eleven, and raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, a little context to what's happening here. This is Peter's first sermon publicly in the book of Acts. And just before this sermon in Acts chapter 1, Jesus was raised from the dead. He spent 40 days teaching the disciples about the kingdom of God, and then he ascended back to the Father. And before he goes back to the Father, he tells his disciples to hunker down in Jerusalem to wait and pray for the gift that God is going to give them, namely the Spirit, that the Spirit will come, and when you have the Spirit, you will have the power of the Spirit, and then at that point, you can go out into the world and bear witness of who I am and what I've done. So he calls them to wait and pray, and pray and wait. And so they do that. They are obedient for 10 days. They pray and wait in Jerusalem. And then on that last day, there is this rushing sound of wind and then we're told that there are tongues of fire falling down from the sky. Again, talk about weird. Like if I see tongues on fire falling down from the sky, I'm like, not today, I'm out of here, right? Like I'm not hanging around to see what that is. But then these tongues of fire fall, this rushing wind comes and fills the 120 believers with the Spirit. And we read this, if we back up to verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues, specifically other languages, real languages that they didn't know. They just start speaking in them. It was a way for God to communicate because at this time, there's tons of people from all over the world in Jerusalem who have all these different languages. And instantly, these 120 believers can start communicating to these people in their own language as the Spirit enabled them. So on one hand, this is an incredible moment. Like instantly, this group of 120, bilingual, just like that. But yet, it's also chaotic. And the people in Jerusalem at that time see this, and we're told that they're be bewildered, and they're confused. And their conclusion is, these people must be hammered. Like, just absolutely wasted. Like, their all-night prayer service was actually an all-night rager, and it's still going on. That's their conclusion from what they're seeing. So Peter's sermon starts as an explanation. Did you catch it in verse 14? He says, let me explain. These people are not drunk. They haven't been drinking old fashions all night. They haven't been living the high life. There is something else that is happening here. Let me explain. They are not drunk. The explanation that Peter gives about what's going on is he's saying this moment is actually a culmination event. That's what's happening here. Namely, the culmination of your story, of Israel's story. See, the people in Jerusalem, what they see, what they think they're seeing, is this chaotic mess. All of these people all over the place speaking in languages that they somehow just instantly learn. But what they're seeing is the giving of the Holy Spirit, which again, for first century Jews, would have been weird because their perception of the Spirit is that it's localized. And at times, it's maybe given to an individual, a specific individual for a specific reason for a temporary period of time. And here, it's just like everybody's got it all at once, and they have no category for what's going on. And what Peter is trying to do, the explanation that he's trying to give, is that this moment is actually a culmination of what we read in the Old Testament 
from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So he quotes from the book of Joel, Joel 2. He says this, verse 16. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Everybody has access to the Spirit, not just specific, special individuals, but everybody. If Oprah was around back then, she would say, you get the Spirit, and you get the Spirit, you get the Spirit. Everybody gets the Spirit. It's open to all people. And so his point isn't that the culmination of our faith is some powerful, supernatural experience which that's what they're seeing and have no category for it, he's actually trying to show and explain that the culmination of our faith is a person. It's not a powerful experience. It's a person, right? Because that's where he's trying to get. He quotes from some more from Joel, but then if we jump down to verse 22, he says this, fellow Israelites, listen to this, colon, right? Here's what I'm going to tell you. Jesus of Nazareth. He's communicating about Jesus. What he really wants to talk about is not this powerful supernatural experience. It's a person. The thing that he wants to talk about is Jesus. Because powerful experiences, they can be great. They can be wonderful. But when it comes to having the right person with you, it can blow that experience out of the water. So uh, Becky and I were fortunate enough to go to England during my sabbatical, and one of the places we went while we were in England was this town called York. It was this really incredible place. It's this old, old city, and it's got this really cool Roman wall that surrounds the downtown area of the city. I don't know how old the wall is. It's got to be, you know, maybe a thousand years old, and you can walk on top of this wall that's a three-mile loop and see the entire downtown walking along this wall. So we did that. And one of the things, no matter where you are on the wall that stands out is this cathedral called the York Minster. It's probably the biggest cathedral in England. It's massive. It was built, they started building it in 2000, not 2000, uh, in 20, excuse me, not 20, 1220. There we go. They started building it in 1220. They finished building it in 1472. It took them 250 years, three or four lifetimes to build this building. Like that's looking at the cathedral from on the wall. It just towers over everything else in the city. And when you walk in, it's just mind-blowing. This is a picture of what they call the nave, their main worship space. They have three worship spaces, the nave, the choir, and the east end. And you walk through all three of them, and it's just like, oh my gosh. This thing is overwhelming. It's massive. It's huge. And then you're thinking to yourself, like, how in the world do they do this? How do they build something this big? So they were renovating or maintaining, doing maintenance work on the building. And outside, they had this little area under like this uh, little canopy of these stone cutters who are working on blocks, probably two feet by two feet square, just chipping away at these stones that they're probably going to use to replace different stones on the exterior and interior, carrying on this tradition of stonework probably from thousands of years. It was fascinating and mind-blowing. So you can buy a $20 ticket or whatever and go tour the building, or, and or you can go for a service. They have daily services, morning prayer, evening prayer, and so we decided to go to one of their evening prayer services, which was in their, their choir sanctuary, which has lots of pews that would go long ways, all facing the center aisle. They had this choir that wa- marched in, and you can just tell there's a bunch of people who are tourists just checking this out, as were we. And it was fascinating, and it was rich, and it was powerful, and it was like, whoa, this is so cool, this ancient space that's still operating as a church. But we walked out of the church. We weren't even like halfway down the steps, and we kind of leaned into each other, and we're like, hey, how was that for you, that 45-minute service? And both of us were like, meh. As far as services go, it was okay. A lot of pomp and circumstance, a a, a lot of, you know, big to-dos. But it didn't stir my affections for Jesus. Like, it it didn't ignite like, oh, yes. Like, I'm so grateful for who he is and what he has done in my life. Oh, 
I want to come here every night, right? It was beautiful. And I'm not trying to judge anything that that church is doing, but a powerful experience can be great. But if that powerful experience doesn't draw you to the right person, namely Jesus, then what's it for? Why do it if it doesn't bring you closer or anybody else closer to him? See, what Peter is trying to do with his sermon is he's trying to say, hey, you're seeing this supernatural experience, but what we're about isn't this powerful experience. What we're about is bringing you to a person, namely Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, who, he says, was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Meaning, yes, Jesus will do powerful, miraculous things in your life. He has the ability to provide powerful, supernatural experiences, but that's not the point. Those are simply sign pointers to who he is, his identity as the Son of God, the Messiah, the true king of the entire world. That's all those signs are for, to show you who he is because it's all about him. And then he starts to make it personal, right? Because he finishes that sentence with, as you know. As you yourselves know. You, you've heard about Jesus. You maybe even saw him when he walked the earth. As you yourself know that he did all these wonderful signs. But it's not about the signs. The question is, why are you pursuing Jesus? Is it for what he can do for you? Is it the goodies and the stuff? Or would you be content if all you got was him? See, Peter's sermon is an explanation like, hey, these people aren't drunk. He's trying to explain that this is the culmination of our faith. And at the center of it stands this person, Jesus of Nazareth. The other thing that his sermon is doing, it's putting out there an invitation to everybody who's listening to it. And the first thing he's inviting them to is relationship, is relationship with Jesus. Because from the very beginning, what God wanted with his people was relationship. We're told that Adam and Eve walk in the cool of the night in the garden with God. He wants to commune with his people. But there's a problem. The problem is ever since chapter 3 of Genesis, there's been this tension between God's people and himself. There's been this tension that separates us from God. And so what Jesus is doing and what Peter is trying to explain as to why Jesus came was it was God's pursuit of us, God's pursuit of his people. And the reason God has to pursue his people is because of that tension that exists between God and his people because sin is in the world. And that's what Peter says next in verse 23. This man, speaking of Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, in the context of this sermon, there could have been people who were actually there when Jesus was nailed to the cross. This is only 50 days removed from the resurrection. There could have been people who were there who were like, I remember that. There was some really strange stuff that happened in the city of Jerusalem that day. There could have even been people who were part of this mob outside Pilate's quarters yelling, crucify him, crucify him. No, we don't want Barabbas. Give us Jesus. Crucify him, crucify him. Could have been people. So when he says, as you yourselves know, and when he says, you, along with wicked men, he could actually be addressing people who were there that day when Jesus was crucified. Now for us, 2,000 years later, we were not there that day when Jesus was crucified. But yet, if we're honest with ourselves, we have to ask the question, is there tension in my relationship with God? Is God pursuing me and I'm running the other direction? Is God pursuing me and inviting me into deeper waters and I'm avoiding and skirting because the tension that often exists between God and his people is around the tension of trust versus control. Trust versus control. The relationship that God is inviting us into is a relationship of trust and surrender. And the question is, 
Am I willing to do that? Or do I just want things my way? And so I'm going to say, yeah, I want the stuff, Jesus. I want the powerful, miraculous, supernatural experiences. But I don't want you because you're asking too much of me. So I'm just going to keep you at arm's length. Where are the places in your relationship with Jesus where he's inviting you to take a step of trust and you're wanting to back away because you want to maintain control? Now, not only is Peter's sermon an invitation to relationship, It's also an invitation to good news. And the good news of this sermon starts with one simple word, the word but. Verse 24, but. But is a contrast word. It contrasts what's going to come after the but is going to contrast what just came before it. And what just came before it was you, along with the help of wicked men, nailed Jesus to the cross, but... And then comes the best part of this phrase, but God. Probably the best two-word phrase in all of Scripture, but God. And what this two-word phrase communicates is that you might think you are dead in the water. You might think this situation is hopeless, but God has the power to make the impossible possible. You may think that your situation is too broken and beyond repair, but God has the ability to restore all things. Amen? And that's good news. And the good news here is namely, Jesus, you along with wicked men, nailed Jesus to a tree, verse 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That's amazingly good news. Amazingly good news that death doesn't win. And then what Peter does here is he reaches back again into the Old Testament He reaches back to Psalm 16, which is a psalm of David, to show that resurrection has always been a part of God's plan. We read this in 25. David said about him being Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, and you will not let your Holy One see decay. You may... You have made known to me the paths of life, and you fill me with joy in your presence. Now, who does Peter say David is talking about here? He says in verse 25, David said about him. This is Peter saying David said about him. Peter is saying that David is talking about Jesus. Now, when you go back and you read Psalm 16, it kind of sounds like David is talking about himself right? Because Jesus wasn't around them. I mean, they knew the Messiah was coming, but they didn't know the Messiah was going to be Jesus. Was he really writing about Jesus? And I'm guessing that Peter probably is anticipating that people listening to that sermon are thinking the same thing. Like, really? Is David here talking about Jesus? And that's why he goes on to say, fellow Israelites, this is verse 29, I can confidently tell you, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. And where is his tomb? It is here to this day. Did David raise from the dead? No, not yet. But Jesus did, right? Verse 30, but he, again, speaking about David, was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. This is a major theme in the Old Testament. It's a call back to 2 Samuel 7, where God goes to David and says, David, I promise you, you're the best king Israel will ever see. And there will be someone like you who's a descendant of yours, who is from your house, your line, and your lineage, who will sit on my throne before me and the entire universe forever. Essentially, the whole Old Testament is about a storyline where there's one who is coming who is like David. There's one who is coming who will be born in the city of David. There's one who is coming who is a better king than David, from the house in line of David. And then he goes on to say this in verse 31. 
Seeing what was to come, he, again being David, spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life. This Jesus who is a new and better David, and we are all witnesses of it. And what he goes on to say is that not only is this an invitation to relationship with God and the, the good news of the gospel, it's also a rela- an invitation to joy and hope. Because did you catch it? In verse 26 and 28, repeatedly, there's this call to rejoice. My tongue will be glad. I will have hope. I will have joy in your presence. There's joy that comes with the good news of the gospel. And it's important to note what Peter is not saying here. He's not saying that joy is superficial happiness based on your circumstances. Nor is he saying that hope is wishful thinking or lofty optimism that everything is going to be okay. Rather, it's confidence. Rather, it's deep-seated contentment even in the face of difficulty. Because I'm going to guess there are people here this morning who either today or in recent days have woken up and your world is in shambles. You've woken up to a world full of pain. That's where our family, personally, has been sitting the last two weeks. So excited to come back from sabbatical. Three or four days in, get the news that Becky's dad is declining fast. We thought we had months. We were planning to take the whole family back to La Crosse to find a weekend to visit him and spend the whole weekend with him. She got the call on Thursday morning. She rushes to get there. By the time Friday morning rolls around, he's gone. And I'm left at home like, and I could, I could tell this to the kids. She calls me 4.30 in the morning on Friday. He just passed. And I couldn't go back to sleep. And it was just like, oh. We knew it was coming. But we thought we had more time. And it still doesn't make it any easier. If you've been tracking world events, there's the war in Israel. And you're hearing all these horrific stories about people being, innocent people being slaughtered and mutilated. And it's just like, oh, like, it, like what? There's no words. Our world is full of pain and brokenness. And what the resurrection does for us Not that it washes over all that, pretends it's not there. It gives us deep-seated confidence and contentment that even in the most painful circumstances, there's going to come a day when all things will be made right. And so even in the pain and the brokenness now, we have hope and we have joy that God is working a plan to restore all things. See, the main point of Peter's sermon here in Acts 2, and the main point of all sermons in the book of Acts, isn't just that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's that at his resurrection, he's ushering in an entirely new reality. And we only experience it now in part, but it's a foretaste of what's to come, that one day every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more pain. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying or shame or sin. It will all be restored and put back together. And we say in this moment, I want in on that, right? And what that means for us personally is that we have a whole new life in the here and now. We have a whole new identity, not marked by our past, not even marked by our presence, because we simply still struggle with sin. We still make bad choices. That doesn't define us. The thing that defines us is Jesus and Him alone. And that's why the people listening to this sermon in verse 37 say this, verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Essentially, how do we respond? How do we say yes to that? And this is what Peter says in verse 38. Peter replied, repent. Now again, repentance could be viewed as this weird religious experience where we make ourselves feel bad about what we've done. We beat ourselves up. We say we're nothing but slimy worms that are just, you know, living in the dirt. But all repentance is, is opening yourself to God. A turn from where you are going back to God to say, God, I want to align myself with you. And then he says, and be baptized. 
which is a symbolic experience that demonstrates you have been washed clean, that you are an entirely new person. He says this, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins, your past doesn't define you. The brokenness of this world doesn't define you. And then he goes on to say, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. See, if Christianity is a random religious experience disconnected from where we actually live, our daily lives, the pain and the brokenness of our world, and it offers no hope, then yes, it would be very, very weird. But if it's an invitation into a new story that's marked by the restoration of all things and humanity in part of that restoration, then people are going to want to say, I'm in because my life is broken. It's full of pain and suffering and death, and I want to be made new. And it's not just an individual thing. It's not just about me getting to heaven when I die. It's a community thing. And that's why the very next part of this chapter is a description of what the early church was like. Verse 42. They, the early Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with the awe of the many wonders and signs performed by the, the apostles. Sure, there was miraculous things that happened, but that's not the point. The point was relationship. Verse 44. Because all the believers were together. And they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And notice this last line. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The world around them saw the way that this community was living, the way they treated each other, the story that was at the center of their community, and they're like, oh, I want in on that. Essentially, you could say this. What Peter is getting at, what Luke, the writer of Acts, is trying to get at with chapter 2, is that it's a Christ-shaped community that can change lives. A Christ-shaped community can change lives. And that's what we want to be about as a church, about being a community of people that has the gospel and the story of Jesus at the center, that's inviting people into that. Like, sure, our building in the years to come is going to be great. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to leave us a lasting gospel legacy, but it's not about a building. It's about bringing people to Jesus, trusting that he is the one who can change their lives. This is who we want to be. We want to be a community of people that invites the world into a new story that's marked by good news, that has hope and joy offered to them no matter their circumstances, and to know that they aren't defined by their sin, but that they can find a home with Jesus, a place where they can belong. I, I can't tell you how often people say that to me, of like, oh, it's the people of this church that make me stay. The couple who dedicated their kid this morning in first service, they drive from Oconomowoc to come here because the way the church came around them during some challenges that they had in their pregnancy. They said, it's about the people of this church and the way they bring us to Jesus and the way that they demonstrate his love and his grace and his mercy for us. And we have that opportunity to invite people into that. So here's my challenge to you as we step into this series. Who, who's the one or maybe two people that God might put on your heart to invite to church? And I'm not asking you to go home today, ring them up or text them and be like, hey, you want to come to church with me tomorrow? We have these gold mugs that you can, if you're new, you can, you know, <laughs> just say, hey, I'm thinking about you. And just start praying for them. Just pray. Paul writes at the end of Colossians, like, I would open a door for you to invite them. Maybe it's to church. Maybe it's to your neighborhood community. Maybe it's just to have coffee with another friend of yours who goes to Meadowbrook Church. How can you step into inviting somebody into what God is doing in your life through our church before we get to the end of 2023? And just see what God does with it. You don't have to be weird and creepy about it. Just say, hey, 
I just want to share my life with you because what's at the center of our life is Jesus. I'm sure they'll see it somewhere along the way. And then we have the responsibility to name that. Like, like this is what has made me who I am. It's not me, it's him. And if we do that, we have the opportunity to see this world around us get turned upside down. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We recognize, Lord, that we are people who are in need, that we need you in our lives, that we are people who are marked by the brokenness of our world, who are marked by sin and death, who have contributed to the breakdown of the world around us. We are people in need of good news, in need of hope and joy. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves to you. We pray that we would be focused on your mission to bring the gospel to the world, to bring more people to Jesus, and that we would be inspired by what the scriptures tell us about how that's always been the mission of the church. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen.